some of the folks who have had just an incredible run in collecting data in in, in pushing digital health to new levels of efficacy are a, our good friends from Sana and uh, Richard Hanbury, the the CEO and the founder of Sana. And uh, Richard, thank you for joining us today. Hi, Stan. Thank you for uh, having me. It's uh, been a great pleasure, and I've uh, enjoyed listening to all the speakers this morning. Um, yeah, it's a, really, it's a really great program, and uh, I think. You know, again, for the audience that doesn't know about uh, uh, you and your company, maybe start off with a uh, a couple of minutes about your your journey and your company. The the very short version is 1992. I had to drive a jeep off a bridge in the Yemen in order to avoid a head-on collision with a petrol truck. Um, 60 foot down, that caused a spinal cord injury. T8, T10. So I'm a wheelchair user still now. Uh, TBI, PTSD. But the biggest problem was a nerve damage pain problem that gave me uh, an overall of five year life expectancy. Um, I was in the, I, I was borderline pediatrics because I, I was 19, um, where you have a high rate of uh, opioid resistance. Um, and so none of the opioids uh, worked at all, but obviously opioids are an appallingly bad long-term pain solution for chronic pain. Um, it's kind of the same story across uh, many of the pharmaceuticals when you're talking about uh, pain or long-term chronic diseases. Um, and, and, and so I uh, realized during that whole process in hospital that when they tried to teach me meditation, that was a dumb idea um, because meditation gives you more present moment awareness. And if your present moment is hell, really stupid to put you back there. Apioids are designed to lower your consciousness, which is why they lower pain. Um, but then I watched a movie. The movie flipped me in and out of what we would now call a flow state. Um, that changed my pain levels more than morphine. And then I was like, okay, so if I had meditated all my life, I would be able to access these states at will. Um, and that would give me a better painkiller. Um, so I started looking at different kinds of stimulation, ended up with audio visual stimulation. Um, this, is a, this is the current version of the device. Um, so back then it was laptops, wires and boxes, and it was my uh, university dorm room. Uh, we put the device on, uh, you're getting pulses of light and pulses of sound that are then generating very specific frequency patterns uh, in, in the brain. Um, that then wiped out all of my nerve damage pain over the course of about three months. Um, and that was 30 years ago. That started the 30 year mission to um, where we are now, wearable tech really started taking off from my perspective, 2015, 2016, 2017, and we're almost now able to make what I want to make. We still have a problem in the wearable space that most of the available sensors are optimized at a firmware and design level for battery consumption, which means they're not done for signal quality. So some of the people you've seen um, with wearables are like us, they've had to um, design or redevelop their own sensors to get data that's good enough to use. Right. Um, so currently, this version of the device, uh, we um, so restarted the company in 2016, um, started then going through the FDA uh, process. We have um, a de novo for fibromyalgia in front of the FDA right now, um, and uh, new data on neuropathic pain. And as of this morning, uh, uh, really good data on, on PTSD. To start, start with the problem. Uh, this is a survey we did at Pain Week, um, which is the most important uh, innovation um, for active clinicians. There's also American Association of Pain Medicine. Um, uh, hang on, sorry. Uh, why is that not working? Um, and yeah, we did a survey of how good do you consider uh, current available treatments? Um, and how interested would you be in an alternative? We gave people four reasons for uh, why they were looking for an alternative and uh, all of the above. And of course, the all of the above category got the vast majority of, of those votes in this 142 person doc, pain doctor survey. Um, so people are looking for alternatives. Now, this has led to, I mean, it's the same in pain, um, opioid use disorder. Um, and one of the very, very big problems has been who's going to pay for it. Um, so Pair Therapeutics is a really good example of a technology that was kind of basically there, um, but couldn't figure out the who's paying for it part. Um, now, luckily for us, uh, CMS uh, produced their proposal in June 
that all breakthrough designated devices would have coding and coverage within six months of FDA approval. Uh, so we're in front of the FDA now for fibromyalgia, and I'll come on to the neuropathic pain uh, in a second. Um, but this is the this is the this is the this is the device. This is the representation of it. Um, pulse light and sound changing patterns in the brain in the same way that um, other people are trying to change it with electrical impulses or uh, magnetics. Um, obviously, the, the 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 drug process and the drugs that are available. Um, everyone knows about the side effects and the problems of most of the drugs that are, are being used in the neuro and pain space. Um, they are the best that's currently available until folks like us come along. Um, in neuropathic pain, though, this is our this is our latest data. Um, this is as of about three weeks ago. This is a pivotal that was done at Mount Sinai uh, with Dr. David Petrino. Um, the the gold standard in pain studies is that you're trying to get the your 30 percent of largest responders getting more than 30 percent improvement and we're at 90 percent improvement on our top 30 percent um within neuropathic burning burning pain and this is 10 this is this is 20 million people with neuropathic pain overall and 10 million people with with burning pain um this was a sham controlled uh, it's really difficult in the device space uh, producing a viable sham that then doesn't have an active effect. Uh, the way the FDA analyzes this data at the moment is very much with a drug bias. Um, so they're trying to remove any placebo effect um, because you can't get uh, people to take a sugar pill ethically and then get the clinical benefit of that placebo effect. In devices, that's not true. In devices, if we could get someone to actually use a sleep mask every night, they would get a benefit from that. But you can't get them to do that. You have to have something more engaging, more active. Um, so that's that's one of the biggest challenges in the in the device space in this area. Um, so that's on neuropathic pain data. Um, this is just one of the ones from uh, to to elicit again the problems of the the drugs in space. Lyrica is the biggest selling drug in both fibromyalgia and neuropathic pain. Roughly eighty percent of people stop taking it. Um, by the six month mark. And then obviously um, by two years, you've literally got, you've got 10% of people who have prescribed it still taking it. And, and you're talking about lifelong conditions here. And as with the device, um, we've got 80% of users still using um, at two years. We get all of our dropout uh, pretty much in the first month or two. Um, we've got a PTSD study ongoing, which is DOD funded. Uh, our dropout rate on that study is 20%, just less than 20%. The average on PTSD studies overall is 50%. Um, and at the moment, we're getting 300% better improvement than on, on, on treatment as usual alone. Um, so that's kind of the summary of where we are now. We've produced a very large amount of data. Um, the Mount Sinai pivotal is 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 the crowning achievement of all of it really clear cut device versus sham where we showed long-term actual changes and improvements uh in the brain in terms of your your biggest concerns around barriers for the adoption of these revolutionary technologies i mean the data was amazing you have you have much better adoption you have much better long-term usage because people are less concerned about you know molecules hitting their pancreas liver kidney side effects things like this so what are the barriers that you're seeing right now with the adoption of these sorts of technologies? Um, it's who's paying for it. Uh, it's, what, it's what everyone has struggled with, which is why the CMS ruling um, in June was so important for us because that solves it uh, with the breakthrough device designation. 50% um, of the pain market is Medicare and Medicaid. Um, another chunk is the, the, the VA. Um, so for startups like us, it, the, the biggest problem is always funding. Um, and the thing that then contributes on funding is, okay, well, how are you not going to be, uh, have the same issues as pair therapeutics? Um, in the neuro device space, everyone so far who hasn't been on breakthrough designation or hasn't yet had the benefit of what CMS has just uh, proposed, um, have solved that by going to the VA. 
So all of the so the VA has had much better access to this new tech. Hopefully now the CMS ruling will uh, fix that for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and for startups like us, we don't need the whole market. We need that starting point, and then it gives us time to figure out um, all the private insurers uh, probably going the Medicare Advantage route first, and then crossing over into um, uh, employer-based healthcare. So. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. <laughs> well, just tremendous data, Richard. Congratulations. We know how much work you put into this and just what an incredible journey you've been on and very, very impressed with the data that's coming out right now. And, uh, oh, wait, we do have one more question. Um, in terms of PTSD, um, uh, one person's asking um, you know, whether or not this is uh, something that can be used for PTSD. Yes, so our PTSD study at the moment is DOD funded. It's a pilot. The DOD has just agreed uh, the three million, three million follow-on uh, pivotal. Um, and at the moment, uh, the, 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 the pilot is device plus treatment as usual versus treatment as usual on its own. And we're getting a 300% uh, greater increase in uh, improvement over treatment as usual currently. Um, so very definitely aiming for for the the, the, the VA um, as, as a primary outlet for, for PTSD. That's brilliant. No, I'd like to talk to you about that offline. There's a forearm study that we did at Columbia about 10 years ago that was amazing in terms of diff different populations and device plus drug versus device versus drug versus whatever. So anyway, just tremendous. Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest problems in the whole of, whole, one of the biggest bottlenecks in the whole of American healthcare is the number of specialist providers at, in mental health care. Um, so which is why the DOD pushed us on to, well, can you help people on the waiting list while we're trying to figure out how to get them to this uh, greater specialist care? And it's basically, you know, theme across um, everything that we're doing is where do we fit into the toolkit? Um, because things like cognitive behavioral therapy on apps, there's a lot of really good work being done, but doing neuromodulation before someone does that, then the two combined, um, we should massively be able to outform most of the current treatments on on most things in pain and mental health. You know, this, this mixture of neuromodulation plus um, cognitive behavioral therapy, derivative apps plus VR, um, you know, the whole digital ecosystem together um, will be providing massively better alternatives for many of the drug treatments that are currently the standard of care. Well done, Richard. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Fantastic. Cheers, Em.